And with me right now is Mr. Stephen D. Kelly. How's it going, my friend? Oh, just another day. What is it, Monday today? It's, uh, yeah, just another day. Another Monday, April 1st. Well, we were just talking before we pushed the record button about the Getty here. That's and, right. Uh, I, I, he's he telling me, Michael here is telling me that quite a few people, you know, good portion of the listeners probably already know who I am. So I think the big debate is, is do we need to do a bio or how do you want to do this? Well, we can talk a little bit about that for a moment here. And I did want to say thank you for being here with me. I wanted to do this much sooner with you, but time and the stars weren't aligned just yet. And now that there is an eclipse underway, now is the time. And I hope you're well, Stephen. And uh, for those who don't know, Stephen has worked with lasers since I think way back in the 70s. And I believe you were a contractor for the CIA, the NSA, and that you've helped create some powerful weapons. Do you have any regrets, by the way, Stephen? That's a bit of a joke, but nonetheless, I, I am certainly interested. <laughs> uh, touche. Uh, regrets. Wow. <laughs> uh, God. All right. Well, let me just put it this way. I'm a firm believer that all of your, you should never have regrets because these experiences are what make you who you are today. But let me just say that I, I'm not, uh, I, I'm not, I don't believe in karma per se, but at the same time, I do believe in service to others versus service to self. And and I do believe that a lot of the, let's just put it this way. There's a lot of people that are dead because of me. So I have a big debt to pay. Oh my. And, and this, yeah, well, you know, <laughs> I think that's kind of what you wanted to hear. Right. And anyway, of course, the point is, is that, uh, uh, you can never do enough to balance your your account, so to speak. And this is why you should always be constantly looking for ways to serve others without expectation of compensation. And that helps you pay for things that you were not doing, <laughs> that you were doing wrong, perhaps. I really like the way that you said that you don't believe in karma because you're the only other person except myself who says uh, things like that. I don't exactly believe in karma either, because if karma was real, this earth would probably already cease to exist, Stephen. Well, anyway, these are these are some pretty strong. Yes, great, great answer. <laughs> I mean, obviously, it's like it, it makes me want to start talking about Gnosticism. But but again, I'm just going to throw it in another direction, just say that culture is is determined by what everybody the body of everybody knows and the mysteries and things that we're moving into or transitioning into are just beyond the comprehension of most people it's like what's under this getty here uh people try to explain these conspiracies right. with uh with what with what they know yeah. and what they can comprehend but they just can't comprehend and this is why it's so important to take a single target like this one and rip rip the the lid off of it you know pandora's box and let let the sunlight down there and let people see what it is because then it's no longer a conspiracy and that's all there is to it it's over from that point on you know there's nothing left to argue about and it's not it's not a matter of pointing fingers and and having polarities being used against us because let the chips fall where they may you know the guilty will be exposed you know Instead of arguing about it and pointing fingers, we should just go, oh, what's it, what's it, what's that going on down there? You know, that's the truth. And then, it's, you know, I mean, that's the best way I know to shut down the, the human, I don't know what you want to call it, humans. They every, it's an ego contest to decide who's smarter, everyone thinks they know everything. And so if somebody, if an idea like this, Occupy the Getty thing, is presented, the first thing they're going to do is deny it and look for excuses of they're going to try to rationalize why it can't possibly be true and on and on. And, and the biggest one of all is, of course, oh, humans wouldn't do that. What kind of human would do something like that? You know, it, it's, right. it's, it's, denial's pretty bad. A lot of people so, yeah. have that issue, by the way, Stephen, when you talk about certain things that would pertain to our own government and how me and you both know, we, but we're the minority. We already know the government doesn't have the best interest for any of us, but there's a lot of those people out there who are, I guess, quote unquote, patriotic. 
and they <laughs> feel like, oh, hell no, my country would never do that. Come on, you're, you're high. Yeah, yeah, I know. All right, okay, well, that that was my big wake up, you know. I mean, right. I used to, I grew up with James Bond and TV and Disneyland and everything, and I was, drove a Ford, you know, I wouldn't drive a Japanese car, that kind of thing. I oh, was, wow. I considered myself a real patriot. Yeah. You know, I, I did, I only bought American guns. Well, I bought German guns, but you know what I mean? I didn't buy no comm blocks. I hear you. <clears throat> but, uh, but I got to say, you know, it's when, 1990 when i was working with the nsa or the oliver north gang and i didn't know who it was i thought it was just the cia and they were telling me stories about atrocities you know carried out by their people and it, it that's where i snapped and basically realized that we weren't one nation under god we weren't the good guys and everything you know Everything went out the window, and I yeah. had to start over. And that was the, that was the big trauma that started all this stuff. But you know, <laughs> that's a crazy. It's a, it's in my book. My yeah, book. it's in the book. It's in the book. And uh, how old were you at this point, Stephen, when you kind of broke away from these uh, contracting gigs here? Well, I didn't really break away right away, but I because I went rogue for a while there. Yeah. But you okay. gotta remember, I I didn't know it was the NSA. Hmm. And I just assumed it was the CIA. And so for a little period of time there from 1990 to, I don't know what, you know, several years later, uh, I I was kind of like uh, on the, everybody knew I was on the outs with the CIA and people that were also on the outs would come to me and they, because they go, wow, how's this guy managed to survive and stuff like that, you know. I mean, don't get me wrong. I was wearing body armor for about a year. You know, because I thought they were going to kill me. And, you know, I had taken a bunch of lasers from them that they, because they didn't pay me, they owed me like a million bucks or something like that. Oh, shit. 600000 or something. I can't remember, but it was a lot of money. I, I knew they were going to rip me off. But 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 that wasn't even the, the big deal of it. That the, Ultimately, they were trying to get me out to Area 51, and they said so. But uh, But anyway, like I said, when... That's when I woke up, 1990, and I'm like, wow. Because uh, I thought, you know, we're, <laughs> we're the good guys. We don't do that, you know, right? We don't, we don't kill men, women, and children, and dogs, and pigs, and chickens, and goats, and whatever. At, at kittens, you know? <laughs> but we, yeah, we do do that. It's, it's, uh, it was pretty bad. So and uh, these people laugh about it, too. Mm -hmm. And by the way, uh, can you tell us uh, some of the things that you were involved with and what were you sort of doing for those who don't really know? When did it you know, really start eating hairy for you? Okay, well, you didn't read my book, I assume. I have not, Stephen. I'm guilty. All right, well, okay. Let guilty me, as I, charged. Sometimes I, I, try, I have to try to remember this stuff, but it was, it was actually 1987 or 78. Okay. Yeah, 78 is when it started. And that was, uh, you know, I graduated in 76, I think it was. Was it 78? That might have been later. I mean, I got a, I got a card over here with a date on it. But, uh, but yeah, that's when we first got hooked up with the CIA. And that was with during the uh, Iran-Iraq War. Oh, okay. Were, when they were sending stuff to those guys. Right. He wanted, I mean, again, we were, we were pretty young. I was in my 20s or whatever it was. And uh, thought this was all cool and sexy. Uh, but then the NSA gig didn't come until much later. And that was during the Iran, or no, the Nicaraguan Contra thing. Ah, uh, yes. Sandinistas, you know. And, and of course, we were, Oliver North was basically running that. And, and I, I worked for the Oliver North gang. But the thing is, is though, and I didn't even realize this until many, many years later. And this is the one thing that will really blow most people's buzz, but it'll probably go right over their head too. And that is that uh, it's all this big mafia, the CIA, NSA stuff. It's not really that's not really what it is. It's this mafia, and the mo and and the guy that hooked us up with the CIA and all that was this guy named Don Nixon, who was Richard Nixon's nephew. They Ooh. called him Don Don Don, I think. Anyway, he was the number two man under Robert Vesco, 
and nobody talks about Robert Vesco, but he got, he died in a Cuban jail, but he was the guy that brought us into the stuff. So we were really high up there. We were just below the, uh, you know, <laughs> it's really high up there. But anyway, this is a funny story. I love to tell this story because, it, you know, it took me years to even realize the uh, gravity of this, this story, but they were looking for me, these guys. It was all, you think You think there's a reason, which there's never the reason, the reason is never what you think it is, but right. they, these guys were looking for me, and they thought it was my brother. They thought my brother was me, but they gave my brother a bunch of money, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars back in early, or you know, the 80s, whatever it was, and uh, <clears throat> he ripped it off, of course. He, he screwed them up, and... And Nixon got really pissed off, and he went to uh, Castro. He went to Cuba, and while he was in Cuba, meeting with this Robert Vesco guy, Castro's police bash down the door and throw them both in jail. Don Nixon's in jail for a couple of months, and Robert Vesco dies in jail. So this is like the head of the international mafia. And <laughs> wow. And yeah, I know that, and that happened. So, but I—that's a long story because I have this. You know, that's where I get into this super soldier business. And is your you know, brother alive or dead? Yeah, he's alive. Okay, I thought where, they might have okay, whacked well, him or what, something. Well, that's where it gets funny is because later on, after dealing with the NSA and having that big falling out with yeah. the NSA, I started getting hooked up to these even higher up guys who I call cavers, but they're like Templars. Templars are, you know, the, the real powerful guys. And they're like the Nazis of the world, I guess. But the Templars, uh, the guy that was the trust fund manager for the Getty, he's a Templar. And he told me, well, he figured out who I was, okay, because he was, they were all thinking it was my brother. They didn't know about me. I see. I'm, I'm a twin. And uh, they had invested all this time and effort into trying to control him, and then they found out it was me. <laughs> and they, they, that night they told me that, and my brother, they said that we were in the Can't Be Killed Club. So... So that tells me that, yeah, they cannot kill us if they wanted to. All right, that that's the way it is. That's why I do what I do, you know? I mean, I know you probably don't know anything about this, but but we have an army. We have, like, thousands of <clears throat> psychics and wannabe psychics and people that I've signed up for a Jedi duty, and we go to war every night, you know, with these uh, non-human types. <laughs> Yeah, I've, I've heard stuff. of you. I, I heard you talk about some of this on uh, your YouTube channel a couple times. Yeah, well, I don't have a YouTube channel anymore. In fact, I got kicked off of Twitter uh, just the other day, and really? I managed to. Yeah, what'd I, you do? I got back in. Oh, I got angry about something, and you know, you're having a little too much it? fun. Uh, <laughs> in other words, it. promoting violence or something like that. I think that's what they call it. You were promoting Psych, violence, uh, okay. Yeah, I'm not a violent <laughs> person, but I was watching, a, I saw a video that made me angry and my response was inappropriate. So they gave me a, they gave, it wasn't a timeout, they actually suspended They actually got account. rid of your account, okay. But I s appealed it and, uh, you know, let's just say I, I swayed them. You swayed them. And what video was this that uh, set you off there? No, uh, it was some, basically, it was one of these immigrants beating up you know, somebody. Oh, okay. It was an assault on camera. I see. Yeah. One of these deals. Yeah. That's usually, actually, one of the things I did, though, is I, I first apologized. I said, oh, my gosh, you're right. This is terrible. I shouldn't have done that. Oh, what was I thinking? And then I said, I must have gotten really angry from watching that video. Why do you allow these violent videos on your platform? You know, so I'm like, uh, uh. That's you know. a really good question, though, because there's <laughs> lots of beheadings, yeah. lots of all kinds of. Lots of crazy things on Twitter that uh, that they allow to fly. It's it's polarizing, right? So they serve their purpose because you know obviously Elon Musk is kind of on the dark side. He seems like a real hero, but at the same time, you could he doesn't really hide the uh, his little satanic inclination, you know, with his mother and his creepy wife and stuff like that. But, uh, yeah, he's he's a little bit on the... No, he, he's a creep. I mean, look what he's doing with the Neuralink and his ties with all kinds of uh, world leaders. He's a bit of a weasel, let's be honest. 
Yeah, yeah. I, you know, a lot of stuff he does is commendable, but on the other hand, <clears throat> everything's suspect and motives are always suspect. And I, I don't, I, hell, I learned a long time ago not to trust anybody. There's, they're really in this world. I mean, it's just like this whole wake up experience you have when you realize that we're not the good guys. And right. It's all shades of gray. There's no such thing as good guys and bad guys. So right. And I've, I've been trying to kick that notion around uh, post 9-11, you know, back during those times when you were considered a piece of shit scumbag. If you question the narrative, you if you recall those glorious times after uh, 9-11. Well, you know, I, I used to fly a flag out in front of my house. And then after 9-11, the flag became a symbol of fascism. Right. And Nazism. Yeah. Yeah. So Oof. How far we've yeah. fallen. Crazy. But then, you know, Ukraine is a wonderful example. If you really want to see what's going on in the world, it's amazing that people don't really see it. I know a lot of people are starting to kind of, you know, they're starting to get a little, a little seed planted. Right. But here you've got people who are obviously being led by <clears throat> Israeli types and they have, a penchant for Hitler and swastikas and, and the SS and all that at the same time. So, you know, that's the thing. For instance, on Twitter, you're not allowed to say Khazarian Mafia. That's one of the quickest ways to get in trouble is to say Khazarian Mafia. And who's that, who's, who's that a problem for? The Khazarian Mafia. Who are they? They're the descendants of the kingdom of Khazaria, who are basically the same people who are the Zelensky government and the world mafia and everything else. So, yeah. you know, if you, the politics aside, you know, there, there hasn't been a dual party system in the United States. Up, it it kind of died after Nixon, you know, up to, up to Nixon, it was still, the takeover was completed during the Nixon era. And that's when, it used to be the Democrats were mostly the Italian mafia and the Republicans were the Jewish mafia, so-called Jewish mafia. And obviously the Jewish mafia is, is became Intertel, which was uh, based on the Lucky Luciano Corporation, I think they called it, or anyway, organization. And this is your Epstein. This is all the trillion dollars slush fund i think there's a, the slush fund they have is about 10 trillion dollars it's probably a lot more now uh, but this money filters down from the crown to the various you know rothschild types soros types and then from there it, it kind of breaks up into republican and democrat so everybody's getting this money but it, this goes back to about 1500, I believe it is, when the Magna Carta was signed, you know, King John and all that at Runnymede. Right. And this is the basically the political system that these, these world elites use. Okay, so if you wanted to learn the flow structure of the corporation, it's right there in the Magna Carta. <laughs> okay, it's now there's actually two versions of the Magna Carta, and of course, I don't think any too many people are going to be able to find the other version, but there was one written for the common people and one written for the nobles. And the nobles one spells it out, the uh, who pays who, how much, you know, that kind of a thing. So, but yeah, basically the crown runs it all. And, but it's like a corporation, the, the different players, your Templars, your Vatican, your, uh, what do they call them? The uh, aristocracy types, the nobles, yeah, your Rothschild types. They all have to work together. And 20% of the take of everything that these various parties own is basically pledged to the crown. So the crown basically owns 20% of everything, you know, although they don't take possession. But that's how this system works. So if you look at the world stage right now, the royal family in, in England. Is, is dead, okay? This is why they're having all these issues because royalty goes down from the female, not, not the male. So, you know, Diana was the last royal. 
and she had these two sons, but she didn't have a daughter. Okay, so whereas the royalty's got to come from a female, this is why there's all this incest because this is the only way they can keep the royal keep that bloodline. Yeah, yeah, it, it's kind of like the thing with the you need to have a Jewish mother to be a Jew, but but you can only be a rabbi if your father is a Cohen. You know that kind of a thing. It's it's a duality there, but it's part of the system. But anyway, yeah. So obviously the boys didn't marry royal royal girls. If they had, if their wives were royal, things would be okay. Kate is very questionable. I don't think she's on par with say a Lady Spencer, you know. But but obviously that other one, Meghan Markle, she has certainly not royal. So and Henry her Harry being a bastard is not a problem. Because it doesn't matter who the father is. The mother's a royal. Her baby's a royal. So royal bastards are, they do count, you know, if they're, if they're done right. So, yeah, there's a big problem. And I highly suspect that the children of Kate were somehow probably not really his children anyway. They're probably the children of a Rothschild. You know, there's probably Rothschild DNA. Yeah, that would somewhere. make more sense. Yeah, I, I think they set that up because according to the the Magna Carta, which is the contract, you're never going to be the boss unless you're the crown, and the only way they're going to get into the crown is by getting their blood in there. So, so this is it's sort of like there's a, a big up for grabs right now, and in other words, and I'll tell you, this whole Getty mission, and this is really the key to this stuff because you got to understand underneath this building here. Not this whole thing. This is just the, like the ele the house that that controls this entrance to the elevator. But what's down there, underneath there, is actually the throne of the crown. So <clears throat> there's two ways you can you can become the crown. You can either be born into it, or you can take it by conquest. So Abs yeah, that's absolutely. the idea yeah. of this mission. And this needs to be done because the British royal family, as I said, are really going to be gone. The Queen was, when once the Occupy the Getty mission started, the Queen was really pissed off, and they didn't really have any alternatives. They tried to move everybody down to, I think it was uh, Madagascar, not Madagascar, uh, over by New Zealand, Christchurch and all that. Not sure, some, some island over there that they wanted to turn into their fort, fortress of solitude or whatever, but... Anyway, so yeah, uh, you want to save the, in, in other words, if you really want to save the world, you don't destroy it, you have to take it over. So in other words, the idea is that we're not trying to kill all these people. These bad guys down there that are eating children and all that stuff, if we, if they think for a second that we're going to cut their heads off and give them what they deserve, they will do everything they can to kill every last one of us before they give up. So I want them to give up. I want them to free the children and right. whoever, whatever slaves they have down there. I want them to free them. No, you know, no retribution. I, I want everybody unharmed. I want all the technology delivered to us unharmed. I want all the, the value and the riches and all that delivered to us unharmed. And for that, they will be able to, to live. They won't be able to reproduce or practice their black magic or whatever it is they do. They'll never drink blood again. They'll never kill any babies, but they will be able to live out the rest of their natural life and treat it like family. Right. So, and, and Stephen, let's back up for one moment here. Tell me how you first heard of... Uh, I guess, child trafficking and the underground city, basically, under the Getty. When did all this information come to you? I, I'm, cu I'm curious. <sighs> well, of course, dealing, you know, all right, I didn't just work for the CIA and stuff. I also had my own company, okay? And in the course of my, my business, which was basically putting lasers on weapons and modifying weapons for police or special forces or whatever. Uh, a lot of people I dealt with were CIA. A lot of people were insiders in just about every little bit of everything. Uh, half the time I didn't know who I was dealing with, but you know, very often coming to my shop was like 
going to Disneyland for these people because I had a lot of toys there and they'd, they'd open up and tell me all kinds of stuff. But I'm also psychic, so I know a lot of stuff. And the first time I ever really drove past the Getty, I knew right away there was something wrong. And it, it just so happened that uh, I had been gone through this recruitment process with so many different people. Some of them turned out not to be people, you know, but uh, something else. And, and, you know, I mean, and I also, you know, here's another big thing. When I, when I got out of bed with the NSA and went into my rogue mode, I hooked up with the Billy Meyer crowd. I don't know if you know who Billy Meyer is. Absolutely. Of course. Of course. Yeah. Well, I was working with them. Oh, <clears throat> okay. And I was doing, I was doing a couple things. I was doing uh, security because I, like I said, I put lasers on guns. I, you know, did lots of special stuff for people. And so Billy Meyer, his his life was he was being threatened. You know, he had people following him around. They wanted to provide them with some security, and so that's why they got me involved. That's also, interesting because I do know. Uh, uh, the media representative for the Billy Meyer contacts. Lee and Britt Elders, uh, Bob Welch, or the other guy, uh, uh, Colonel Stevens? Well, this was actually Michael Horn, uh, who I, I bring on the program all the time. He's kind of like a regular here. But, but he's talked to me about these threats that Billy Meyer had received. And I always thought, well, I was a little skeptical about that. But he was actually receiving legitimate threats. Is that what you're confirming here, Stephen? Yeah, he oh, had. Wow. A, let me just tell you. You you know when it's real is by how much they follow you around and sneak up on you and all that crap, hide in the bushes. And right, stuff. yeah. And, and, of course, I was used to all that because, you know, NSA, I mean, come on, right? I thought, you know, I figured once you, once you go toe-to-toe with the CIA, you're not going to be afraid of anything. But when I, when I, and I'll tell you, when I got hooked up to these Billy Meyer people, I didn't believe any of it. You know, I saw the pictures and I'm like, damn, those pictures look really good. And but but the reason why they really wanted me was because I was a electrical optical engineer who happened to be very well versed. This nothing's by accident, very well versed in microphotolithography, laser technology, photomultiplier technology, ion laser technology, solid state laser technology, and also I had I had developed some very special processes for manufacturing of fine silver. All of this is extremely tied into this whole UFO business. And and that was always been a big clue for me when I was getting close to something was because that stuff would come into play, but but they wanted me to help them from a technical standpoint. I was supposed to help them figure out what the technology was. I was supposed to help them de-engineer this stuff, and that's kind of what I did, and that's kind of why They've been trying to get me out to Area 51 for so long because they wanted me to manage their stupid production. But, you know, it's like Bob Lazar said, you get you get hooked up with those guys that will be pointing a gun at you the whole time. And I don't like that. <laughs> I don't blame you. Anyway, but uh, so, and I had, a, I had a reputation. Nobody wanted to mess with me because I was a, a shooter. I used to carry a Glock around. And I was I put these lasers in the Glock, and right. the, it was the most accurate laser in the world. I mean, it's still the most accurate laser in the world. Nobody has made anything better, but but that enabled me to be you know really really good dot dot the eyes and hammer nails, whatever you want, light matches, you know that kind of thing. Put holes in the holes, and that scares people, you know. Yeah, and I can I, it wasn't just it wasn't just pistols. I also did. MP5s, MP5K, you know, MP5K is a pretty small gun. And you don't even have to hold it. You don't even have to aim. I could hold it at the hip and, you know, hit something a half inch. Pretty much, inch yeah. Bit. Yeah. Those are awesome so, guns, by the way. Like, I prefer the MP5. I fired them plenty of times. You don't you like the K? I, I mean, I do, but I, I, I think I just like the MP5. It, it has a sort of... Uh, a sort of feel, I guess you can say. Well, maybe you've seen my product. I'm, that's what I was going to say. I think I might have even used your all product right, before. All right. Let me see. Can <laughs> I change my... Uh, I should change my thing here so I can show you some of my guns, man. Oh, my. 
Let me see if we can do that. Cool. Here. I like that. Let's see. Virtual background. I'm going to upload something. Do, do, do. Okay. Come on. This will. Okay. You go ahead and I'll talk while we're trying to upload something. No worries. Oh, log in. Sign up for free. Uh, no, it's too, too difficult. It's somewhere in there. Well, we'll I, had, find I was going to upload a file, but apparently, let's see, virtual background. I have a green screen. Oh, yes, I do have a green screen. Oh, wow, that kind of oh. made it worse. That made you, you um, kind of transparent into it a little bit more. All right, let's get rid of that. It says here that a green screen works better. Okay, we're just going to leave it like that because it looks like I can't do this from while we're in. Plus, your stage. microphone's like floating, so that looks cool. <laughs> I don't like that. Basically. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, we went into a couple different directions, but I'll tell you, you know, when you when you get into the CIA business and the right. whole spook business, uh, you find out right away that, you know, you have to kind of change, you open your brain. You got to have an open mind. And one of the first things you're going to get hit with is your, your perception on religion, mm. of course. And yeah. that's directly related to your perception on this whole UFO business. Because you kind of find out that, you know, we're not all what we, you know, it's like you find out we're not the good guys all the time. Right. That's the first clue. And then you find out that your religion is kind of, there's a whole bunch of variations and stuff that don't don't jive with what you've been taught. And and then, of course, the, the, the alien business. Yeah, the alien business. Yeah, we, you know, you I, know, I talk about that all the time here on the program. But what exactly are your thoughts with uh, the government and all these whistleblowers coming forward and all this discussion? Is it actually going to lead us somewhere, or are they are they just yanking or yanking our our chain here? Yes, they are yanking your chain. Most of the people out there. I mean, I don't want to name names because I could go down the list of the who's who. We like Trust names me, here. I was, I was part of. Uh, well, I mean, take your pick. You know, it's like one of the biggest ones, of course, is uh, Greer, Stephen Greer. Stephen Greer. Uh, I mean, yeah, these guys, all right, here's your big clue. If they're trying to make money in any way whatsoever, toss it. Um, and I got to tell you, when I was dealing with Billy Meyer and and his crew, Britt and Lee and, and Bob Welch, they all had a gig. They all had something going on. and And for sure... They were trying to sell videos. I mean, yeah, they had a lot of content that they had collected with Billy, and they yeah. were trying to sell it. And, you know, VHS tapes and stuff like that. And right away, that just completely went away, went against my personal philosophy. Mm -hmm. And it also sort of tainted my opinion of what they were doing. And some of it was just like Bob, Bob Wells. She had a, he had a project he wanted to do. It was a chair. You'd sit in this chair and play Nintendo, and your chair would shake and do all this this is before anyone else had thought of doing stuff like that. Right. But I was an engineer. I had my own little manufacturing company and everybody came to me. Oh yeah, let's make this. Let's make that. And I'll tell you something. A lot of the laser technology that's out there today that we take for granted, it wouldn't even be here if it, if it wasn't for me, you know, because one of the biggest things that I did when I was working for the NSA was I made solid state lasers cheap. You know, because before before I started working for those guys and, and uh, had a big contract, you had to pay like three hundred fifty dollars for one one just one laser diode, mm -hmm. and uh, they didn't last very long. They were like light bulbs that were kind of sketchy, so to speak. Everybody was scared to to buy one because they, you know, you could blink at it, and uh, it dies. But I had an order, you know, for uh, what was it? I think it was forty thousand uh, gun sites. Yeah, and and it used so so with those numbers, I was able to bring the price down to about thirty bucks, thirty five. No, actually, thirty one. You know, it was a thirty three dollar and a thirty six dollar version. But point is, is that it got the price down to where suddenly all these people could afford it. Right. You know, because like Toshiba or whoever it was at the time was Toshiba uh, was able to build a machine capable of producing these things because we were paying for it, you know. And, of course, because it was CIA, uh, it gave it a certain prestige. You know, this was before Desert Storm. You know, this, of course, this was when uh, George Bush Sr. was in office and all that, I think. But uh, anyway... Yeah, so 
so I was the, the kind of like the public face of these people. And I would go out to these companies and solicit whatever. I mean, I designed the thing and, you know, spec all the parts and what have you. And then I was the, the, the face of the company that went out and did this. So when I go into some manufacturing company or whatever and say, yeah, I've got this contract here with the CIA and they want to buy, you know, 40,000 or this or that. They're like, yes, sir. Wow. Right. You know, and I, I had a lot of, ability you know i mean i had to do a lot of dog and pony shows don't get me wrong yeah but that's kind of <laughs> you know. now, now the now the the listeners at home know why i asked you if you had any regrets oh regrets, regrets. <laughs> i mean about these uh, yeah. the the technology you're responsible for uh, creating has uh, obviously uh well it's taken a lot of lives yeah 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 that's 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 it. pretty well, heavy i'm sure um Slightly. It wasn't didn't just start with the lasers. It started before that mm. because when I worked for uh, the electro optics business, I worked for several companies. Some of them big, some of them small. Yeah. I went from technician all the way up to senior engineer, quality control uh, manager, stuff like that. And each one of these companies made parts that went into some system, and some of these systems of course, are very ubiquitous, like the uh, uh, the Cobra helicopter, you know, or the uh, M1 tank, okay, American stuff. We also made stuff for the Israelis, and we knew that the stuff that we made for them was going to get used, you know. There was no question about it. And I always thought, you know, post-Vietnam, that that uh, that we wouldn't be using any of these things. It was all this uh, mutual shared destruction business, which unfortunately is dying, and that that these everything that we made would just end up in the desert somewhere in storage. But no, then along came Desert Storm, and uh, you know, and and whatever it was, the two of them. The first was the Kuwait one, and that was really really personally hard for me because of the the whole road out of Basra business. Mm. If you remember that little yeah. incident? Yeah. Well, anyway, for me, that was like a big uh, disturbance in the force. Okay. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. That's quite anyway, common. But yeah. It was, you feel it. You feel it. You feel it like gravity, like way it weighs on you. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, so, yeah. So, so there's, you know, and then, and then, of course, but you see, here's the thing. My products were mainly designed to save people, okay? So, like, for instance, before 9-11, before anti-terrorism became popular or sexy, or I don't know what you want to call it, marketed, um, back before 9-11, we it was righteous, okay? Because we were rescuing hostages, we were doing all kinds of stuff, and and... My technology allowed them to shoot the bad guy and not hit the the, the hostage, stuff yeah. like that. And uh, so we we're about rescuing. And the other thing is visible lasers. And I was really, this is one of the reasons why I hold, did the whole visible laser thing for cops. I kind of invented all that stuff. But is that when a somebody's running away from a cop or somebody's fighting with a cop rolling around the ground, mm -hmm. uh, they're not going to stop until somebody shoots them. And, but when they see the red dot, they get a minute to think about it. Yeah. A second. To, it's, it's pretty intimidating. Well, it's, it's, uh, I mean, if you go by the very early stages, when, when you get that red dot on you, you realize he's not going to miss. Yeah. You're screwed. And you should give up. Right. So, so I could say that back then, that I th saved a lot of lives on both sides of the gun. Yeah, um, absolutely, absolutely. But at the end of the day, a lot of these weapons will, of course, be used against other Americans, and we see that we we you know we have a good timeline of that. Well, I've I've was very particular about who I sold to. I didn't. I I only sold to. Uh, well, they kind of controlled the, these. The government kind of controlled who I sold to. When you're like a contractor of sorts, yeah, I'm sure they have some well, sort of regulation. No, it's not. Well, or it's not like, that. For instance, more strict or looser. 
well, Israel has a lot to say about who gets what. Ah, uh-huh. <laughs> okay. The tiny hats. Yeah. yeah, yeah, they they do. They, um, for instance, uh, I was not allowed to sell to Arab countries. Okay. Ah, uh, yeah. But but I got away with it once because I was sneaky, mm. and I I sold a bunch of laser systems for the MP5 to uh, United Arab Emirates, and but I was. And I had I had gone through the the le- legit processes of uh, getting the end user certificate and all that stuff, so I was kosher. But at the same time, they would they would not let it happen. They weren't going to let it happen. Right. And so I I found a way around it, <laughs> hmm. and it managed. And when everybody kind of freaked out when the product got delivered, because like holy crap! But I'll tell you something. Every time I invent something, they rip it off almost immediately, and and they don't care. I didn't really trust the government. I mean, I sh- I could have had I could I I could have been a billionaire, but I didn't want to kill all those people, you know, because I uh, see, I knew what was coming, and it it started. Uh, well, I did work I did work for China. I did work for Israel. I did work for a lot of people, but they they would never do it the way I said. You know, in other words, there's a lot of ego out there. And the last mm. thing they want to admit that one person, what I did was no one else in the world could do. Okay. And, and there's, I, I'm still kind of proud of that because you should yeah, be. No, nobody could do what I could do. But, yeah. but the thing is, is that uh, they all tried to do it different. They didn't want to make it look exactly like, like my product. That's because, where an ego you know, comes in. That's where the as ego you mentioned. Comes in. Yeah. You see that in well, every Chinese uh, form. engineers, you know, well, yeah, mm-hmm. every country has an ego, right? They've right. got their their engineers, but uh, but anyway, so but I'll tell you though, you know, just to get away from the gun business and all that. Um, well, the whole business with like Matrix, okay, you know, you, the movie The Matrix, you see you see them with all the guns and and the, the raincoat or I don't know, raincoat, what do you want to call it? Trench Leather coat. Coat. Trench coat. Yeah. Um. Okay, that was actually based on me, <laughs> because, um, because the you know this is story or the destiny or whatever you want to call it, the prophecy is that I'm going to show up there and and take you know take out the Getty, this place right here, and attack them. And the the scene. Let me see where I can. I can uh, but again, uh, Stephen. How, again, how how did you come across uh, the the Getty and? Oh yeah, we child trafficking. How I ramble? It's okay though, but I love that. I'm I'm glad you're sharing this with me. I I'm, I feel like um you were meant to say this here on the on the program. All right. Well, the one guy Vince. Yeah, it's always good to get new material out there. But the one guy Vince that I was dealing with when I was doing the plasma beam project with yeah. CIA guys, he was. This was post uh, NSA uh, when I'm back in bed with the CIA again. Uh, he he turned out to be a reptile. But he was the one that basically told me about the bunkers and stuff and about the people that lived in the bunkers, you know, the cavers. The bunkers. And okay. Yeah, the bunkers, the DUMBs, the Deep Underground Military Bunkers. Right, okay, that's right. what this is. This is the entrance to a DUMB the size I see. of okay. all of Los Angeles. People think it's a little tiny bunker. No, it's the size of the entire damn city. Yeah. It's huge. It seems massive. But, uh, and, you know, by the way, Stephen, I can't, I did come across your work numerous times. And being a local Southern California resident, you hear a lot of stories about underground tunnels and bases. And there's an underground tunnel uh, and base off the coast highway right before you uh, hit Long Beach, Malibu. by the way. Yeah. And there are various tunnels around there. You know, there were some used uh, for raves in Los Angeles. Perhaps those spots have been taken out by now but there are plenty of places out there for those who are wondering but yeah well, there's, but the spawn were mafia tunnels right there's, there's civil defense tunnels there's there's tunnels dug by aliens there's tunnels dug by atlanteans there's you know i mean it's all the same thing but yeah i've always been curious about uh, the spot that we're specifically talking about right now the getty museum you know, I've always heard the rumors that uh, child trafficking is indeed going on in kids in actual cages that type well, of thing. What about P. Diddy? I mean, come on. Or P. Diddy, you know, another thing. P. Diddy's house is probably connected to the Playboy Mansion, which is connected to all these other houses. All these old Hollywood houses have been connected since forever. I mean, right. I think P. Diddy owns the former 
Humphrey Humphrey Bogart home, and uh, and then of course there's the uh, the Brad Pitt home, which we know has a tunnel, which is across the street from the uh, what is it? it used to be the Lily Tomlin home, but before that it was the uh, uh, Chester C. Fields home or whatever his name was, you know. Uh, so yeah, or Charlie Chaplin's home that used to connect to the which which is the Brad Pitt house, which used to belong to Cecil B. DeMille. I mean, it's going on forever. It's just like the pedophilia at, at uh, Nickelodeon. At we Nickelodeon, were talking about on, right? You know, and then and then Disney, of course, massive pedophilia. It's all the same people, and it's so extensive and it's so it's so in your face that, for instance, not too far from the Getty is the University of uh, California, which is UCLA which is connected by tunnels to the Getty, which also has six underground basement levels. And this is just right across the street from the federal building in L.A., which is a, you know, big, tall building. It's got tunnels. That's right. So when I call up the FBI and say, hey, investigate the tunnels, why don't you just go down in your basement and go straight there, you know, avoid the freeway? And I've talked to victims you know, a woman who was a mouseketeer and who was a victim of all this uh, adrenochrome collecting and all this crap. And she told me that it didn't matter where they went in. They could go in at Disneyland at Club 33. They could go in, go in somewhere in Chinatown at some, you know, speakeasy or whatever. They could go in from Mark Taper Forum, which, of course, is where they have the Oscars and all that. Uh, these entrances... But it's a sponge. You know, it's like you go, you talk about these various tunnels you were talking about earlier. Yeah, everybody's got a basement. Everybody's got a tunnel connecting to other people's basements. Everyone's got stairways that go down, that connect to hallways, that connect to trams, that connect to who knows what. It's a huge system. Yeah, everyone has I mean, tunnels. Yeah. Even now in New and, York, that we saw that rabbi uh, crawling out of that well, manhole with uh, there. That, of course, was not very extensive comparing to what we're talking yeah, about. That, but I will tell right. you this, because you are asking about how we knew about this stuff. And yes, of course, sir. we used a lot of psychic psychic work. But I'll tell you, I have so many psychics behind me and working for me that <laughs> it's like having a supercomputer at your access. I Anything I want to know, if anybody that screws with me, I turn my team loose, I'm going to know everything. I'm going to know everything. I'm going to know where the bodies are buried. I'm going to know where your tunnel entrances are. I'm going to know who owns what house. It's like, it's like doing a title search. I can do, I can do that and I can do it with psychics. It's crazy. Uh, but, but the thing is, is that, uh, when we originally found out about the bunker under the Getty, mm -hmm. we immediately followed the tunnels to see where they went. And one of the places that we found right away that stood out, was the Skirball Center, which is, of course, the largest Jewish cultural center in the United States. Oy vey. And it, and it has a massive tunnel. And if you go right across the street from the Getty, there's a prominent synagogue oh. that is dedicated to a controversial rabbi. What a coincidence. Yeah, but, but I'll tell you, when I was running the QAnon group, which was a co-op of course psyop um i f i got attacked by roger stone and really he, he was yeah well it was a t it was the mayflower group you remember, if you remember the mayflower group they used to be kind of a quasi qanon sub cult anyway they they attacked me but they turned out to be basically when you attack me like i said i respond with overwhelming Force. And I found out everybody that was involved in this operation, it went all the way up to Roger Stone, who, of course, is, you know, a big player in the whole Q thing. But um, we found everything. And we found this one home in L.A., uh, Encino, actually. And it's just, you know, so many miles away from the Skirball Center. But it, it was hooked up by tunnel to the Skirball Center, which ultimately hooked up to the Getty. And this particular home belonged to a Hollywood uh, talent agent who handled famous comedians, you mm. know, like Drew Carey and stuff like that. Tim Allen. A lot of degenerates, uh, in other words. Well, you know, everybody's, well, I mean, everybody's controlled. But, 
but he had a club yes, in, in his property. Ways. I mean, they, they did satanic sacrifice at that home. He owned actually two houses. Uh, the house next door to his was the one that actually had the tunnel entrance. You could drive into the garage and go right down into a tunnel. And that home was actually on the deed. It was, it was uh, basically the owner was a Netflix executive. But we know that that Netflix executive wasn't the right. real owner. It was this other guy. This, mm. this guy was a high cult member. But we exposed him, and they had to dig up a bunch of bodies and stuff. But, but the bottom line is that obviously this can't be killed club thing is very useful because the entire system down to your friendly police officers and your judges and your doctors and your take your pick your attorneys and detectives and all that they're all part of this big mafia you know your government your your mayor your whatever uh it, it's pretty bad so so the city of L.A., for instance, where all this is going on, I mean, I, I have people probably every day are calling the FBI or calling the uh, Human Relations, Public Relations Office over here at the Getty, asking them about this. You know, is it, you know, and, and there's all kinds of, what do they call those things, uh, fact checker articles. I see, yeah. And they're actually, yeah, they're using my name now, which is incredible oh, okay. because uh, the secret to this. You made of course, it. Getting, yeah, well. The point is, is, I need them to engage me because if uh, if there's a human that's saying these things, that it's not a conspiracy; it's a slander or a libel. Correct. If it's not true. Yeah. So I'm basically challenging the Getty, which is a multi multi billion dollar institution foundation, to make me stop saying these things. That's true. So, or they could have you they, unalive yourself. As they, as well, the kids say on the on the interwebs, yeah, delete, compost, whatever you want to say. But I, I think uh, delete is probably one of the safest things you can say if you want to wish harm on somebody. True. Compost seems a little obvious, you know, turning somebody into plant food. But but yeah, um, have you got have you received threats? Uh, by the way, Stephen, <laughs> in regards to any of the shit that you've been talking here, I I. I provoke. I go out of my way to provoke these people and threats. No, anybody that threatens me dies. It's just it's oh my. many. There's many dead people. Uh, many dead people. Anyone that has malice for me, yeah. It, even if I never meet them, they will. They will die. They'll perish. Typically, what happens? It's kind of uh, commensurate to the amount of whatever it is, the hatred that they have. I see. But it could be anything. It's usually very violent, like a violent. Uh, collision with a car or or a very bad disease like a natural cause in other words um their life would pretty much downward spiral if they well let's say if you were to words. try to get in a car and drive over here and try to kill me you'd right. probably have a fatal accident oh my before you got here you know that's well probably. Stephen, for the record there's no bad blood between me and you um for the record okay. you know yeah well you know, how, the best way to assure that is I see your face. That's true. I mean, I could give you a personal call. I mean, I'm not afraid. Um, no, 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 asking. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, I don't really, I have an altar, you know, that I call Rambo. Right. And he's he's sort of me on another, uh, in, on the other side, so to speak. But I don't really understand the real nature of this stuff, but it's pretty mysterious. I mean, Rambo tries to explain it to me, and it's all really kind of, kind of quasi-religious, if you will. You know, right. And, and that's another thing, uh, Stephen, are you religious? Obviously, you obviously are religious, but are you like a what do you identify as, if you don't mind me asking you, like a Christian, well, a Catholic? I don't know. Maybe a. All right, I was raised. Maybe Catholic. Muslim. Who knows? Uh, I'm a little bit of everything. But here's the thing. The man made stuff is ridiculous. Like, for instance, uh, like Scientology. When dealing, now, when you're dealing with these different levels of density, and you're you're exposed to stuff like you know UFOs and yeah. aliens and alien culture and all mm -hmm. that stuff. You really have to revise your understanding, and and the real thing that you need to understand is the mechanics of of the universe, because this is the one thing mm -hmm. that Earth humans have not really come to grips with yet. And this is why they don't understand quantum computing. They don't understand all these things because they don't understand the the real mechanics. They use words like dimension, which which are real, but they don't use words like density, which is much more important. So 
when you understand density, you understand the nature of infinity. I mean, that's the best way to describe it because it's yeah. just like a quantum computer. It's accessing infinite, infinite information through through using the densities. But unfortunately, like I said, Earth humans are not really prepared to understand this stuff, so they don't know how to explain it. It's kind of like string theory. But, um, you know, I mean, it's like Tesla said, you got to combine metaphysics. Science needs to combine metaphysics if it's ever going to go anywhere. So... Unfortunately, humans aren't really programmed to do that. But the point is, is that when you understand this stuff, you know, like, for instance, Jesus, where his actual position is in relationship to, say, like the creator or the Holy Spirit and, and heaven and hell and these things that we like to talk about. We don't really understand their actual position in the actual reality of the universe. You know, there is a structure and the structure is based on the ratio of physical to spiritual. Uh, basically, a thought to something physical, uh, an idea, mostly an idea per se. So, so the highest level of density is pure thought, which of course is the creator, and then the lowest level of density is inanimate matter. And then of course there's soft matter and there's all that stuff, quantum matter, the quantum uh, but the quantum is like on level four, and there's nine levels. But Jesus, of course, is on level uh, seven, okay, which is two levels above heaven, if you will, with the angels in between. People don't understand these things. So, so the the point I'm trying to make is that this concept, this persona, this entity that we know as Christ, right. And I don't want to confuse Christ with Jesus because that's the big question. It, that That is a very old entity that has been here since the beginning of creation. So to try to use some sort of human, earth human uh, description or book or, or uh, you know, uh, tools for understanding, it's, you can't even come close. So... So I I know I know Jesus is the the person that was Christ here on earth for 35 years or whatever it was and then I know the other side and the other side is something very cosmic it's something very ancient it's something much bigger than anything that that we could try to uh define here on earth and that entity is the leader per se at least as far as uh, our concern is is the liaison is our liaison to source, which is the highest level, of course. And ultimately, the politics of the universe is divided into two sides, and this is very important, and that is the service to self and the service to others. So when you talk about Jesus as an entity, he is the commander of the service to others faction, which is about two-thirds of the entire universe. And the other side is the service to self side, which you could define as uh, Satan, Lucifer, Sophia, uh, Lilith. Right. You know, whatever. I mean, and you know, the, see, that's the other thing about religion per se. There, it's meant to polarize you. It's meant to confuse you. Uh, but the polarization is really the tool of Satan, and that's the nature of our third density that what we're on right now is that in the third density we have a relatively lively equal amount of sto and sts living side by side that's your yin and your yang you know so uh, and you have to understand that the yin and yang is changing so it's it's ever changing shades of gray but so yeah so this this big adventure that we're on right now is our opportunity to devote at least 51% of our lives to serving others. And then that way, when we transition, we get to be on the, the people, the side of the people that look like actual humans and not the side of the entities that look like lizards and insects and birds and stuff. No, well, that like makes sense to me. Yeah. yeah. So, so basically, the way it works is that when we when we transition, we go on these, you know, we start at level one. Obviously, if you read your Bible, they talk about Lucifer coming down and becoming the rocks. Well, Gnostics believe that was uh, Sophia 
coming down and starting all this stuff, which is actually Lilith per se. I mean, anyway, that's all that's all twisted. But the point is, is that all this life has to work its way back up. It's the opposite of the Big Bang theory. Every piece of matter in the universe is going to return to the point where it originated, which is the beginning of the Big Bang, at which point it repeats the process. And this takes, you know, billions of years. It's just the it's just the heartbeat. Everything resonates. The Big Bang is just a resonance taking place. Right. It's, so, yeah. It's like a big heartbeat. Kind of like we have. Only it's a heartbeat that takes whatever it is, billions of years to complete and then start over again. That's the nature of reality. But fun stuff. I know. I, hey, I, I should mention. Let me just ahead. tell you real quick. I'm yes, going to give you a quick commercial. Go for it. I'm doing this event in Los Angeles. Oh, okay. At, uh, let me see, April 14th through 16th. It's at the Sonestra Hotel right next to the LA airport. Biomedexpo.com if you want to check it out. <clears throat> but I have three lectures I'm going to be doing. One is not actually a lecture. It's actually a training, but I want to talk about this because this is kind of significant. And that is the first lecture I'm doing on Friday, I'm going to be talking about super, not supercomputers, but quantum computers. I'm going to talk about the nature of quantum computers, the nature of qubits, and I'm going to explain it in ways that you won't get talking to a basic physicist because not too many people really understand the quantum. And of course, once you start dealing with the, you know, Billy Meyer types and all that, you understand that stuff. And then after that, I'm going to be doing a lecture on Saturday about the alien technology, basically achieving light speed and how you construct a beam ship. And this is based, of course, on my experience with doing this stuff. Uh, you know, I mean, part of one of the projects I was working on before I got run out of town and shut down was I was working on light speed propulsion with the uh, University of Colorado. And I d basically developed a material that they could expose, that they could, that basically was a massive laser material that could produce extremely ridiculous amounts of ultraviolet light and essentially push something up to the speed of light. And then my biggest discovery, of course, was the using of silver to, as like a semiconductor material for ultra high resolution manufacturing. And this is basically what these beam ships are. They're big, giant semiconductors. But but on Sunday, I'm going to do a Reiki Level 1 course, teach people healing, basically teach people how to move energy and do healing and, and this kind of thing, which is my big thing now. And, you know, because it's I'm not all about guns and lasers now. I'm, I'm all about, you know, psychic skills and, and you know, fighting against non-human entities. So doing healing is right. a great way to increase the skill, you know. Uh, and that, of course, is the serving others business. So, yeah, if you want to get powerful, you serve others. Yeah. Go check them out, ladies and gentlemen. Over in uh, Los Angeles, if you are a resident of uh, California, make the drive and uh, see fly, Stephen out there. Fly, fly, fly out there. Yeah, that too. Yeah, but get, you got to get your tickets if you're interested. I mean, yeah, you gotta you got to go to that, that website, of course, which will take you someplace. And it's not cheap, of course. you got the hotel. I mean, I'm sure they've got rooms, but... But the point is, I'm just trying to say, for instance, on Sunday, this course that I'm giving is free. It's actually an eight-hour course. It's free. Okay, you will get a Reiki Level 1 certification if you hang out in that room with me all day on Sunday, assuming assuming the room. I, I, well, I don't know how big the room is. I think it's either 60, 100 people. But if you could get in there, that's a, what is that worth? A free Reiki cert, right? I mean... And it's worth some money. It's worth it's worth it just for that. So, but uh, what I was trying to explain was that uh, if you really want to learn more about this stuff, those three lectures combined would really give you a broad understanding of a lot of complex stuff, like the electromagnetic spectrum, uh, and you know the name, you know the what is it, the particle wave theory. Quantum, quantum computing, all this stuff. Uh, it's going to be pretty high, intense. So 
unabashed commercial, but it's just that, yeah, the stuff we're talking about, if you want to learn more, that's a good place to go if you want to yeah, follow up. Absolutely. Go out there and uh, check out the event. And uh, just a random question here. I'm sure you've heard of the Finders Cult. Uh, do you think there might be any direct involvement with them in the Getty Museum? Well, of course. You're talking about the CIA-run white vans that go out that Ted Gunnarsson was talking about. <laughs> yeah, of course that's all real. Everything that right. Ted Gunnarsson said was real. I mean, I've, 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 I've spent a lot of time researching that stuff, and I'll tell you, <coughs> I went to Satan's Castle, which is the, the place up in, uh, what do they call it, uh, up by Big Bear and, and, let me see. Yeah, it's by uh, Big Lake Bear. Lake Arrowhead. Lake Arrowhead, yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm trying to remember the actual city, but yeah, I went up there. I actually made a video. It's out there. Oh, wow. The film taken, but, nice. but yeah, what they would do is they would take the kids, put them in the tunnel, go to the garage next door, put them in a van, uh, but that's not the finders, but then they, the finders would pick up kids and they take them, they take them straight to the Getty. Yeah. They take them straight to the Getty. Okay. Ooh. Yeah. I had a feeling they were uh, involved somehow. Of course they are. They, they do you know what they do they'll go to raves parties and uh -huh. they will they will invite these young kids at these raves to go to a special parties and it's kind of like uh pinocchio treasure island and stuff like that but but the ted gunderson thing uh they would put them on a little plane over there in uh, i think it was the santa monica airport and then they would fly to crestline i think is the place there's a little airport up there and here's the thing about these Whenever you find one of these satanic nests, like that one I told you about over in Encino, yeah, it's going to be right above a water reservoir. Okay, because when they commit these things that they do, they create this black chi, for lack of a better word, we'll call it black chi. And it's if you're if you know anything about feng shui, you know what I'm talking about. But the black chi flows downward, so they'll flow right into the water reservoir, and the water, of course, is a she's superconductor so they're polluting the water supply uh -huh. with this this crap this black chi and it of course that makes it spread but so yeah they whenever you find the the one in encino of course was backed up right next to the encino reservoir and the the one over there in crestline was right above this thing they call diablo reservoir of course coincidentally you know <laughs> yeah good, nice name yeah, but uh, but yeah, that that investigation goes way back because the tunnels, Riverside used to be a really huge ne mafia nest. In fact, at one time, Riverside was way bigger than Los Angeles. Wow! They they, they actually used to do the Oscars in Riverside before they did it in Los Angeles. And the reason why they did that was because Riverside was old school mafia stuff, and they had lots and lots of tunnels. I mean, you go to any old town, town part right. of whatever, yeah, there's there's going to be tunnels, and they did the, well, what do they call it, the prohibition tunnels and stuff like that. But those tunnels are still there. And I'll tell you, like, some of these tunnels, like there's one tunnel that goes underneath Lake Arrowhead, and it was dug out by the Chinese uh, coolies labor, and they had uh, they had a train that would go through this tunnel. Wow! And it it was used for smuggling alcohol or something of this nature because there was a lot of mafia people up living, you know, at Lake Arrowhead. And yeah, like that. That doesn't surprise me at all. It's kind of like the drug dealers in Miami. It was sort of like that back in the day, but but yeah, there's. Uh, a network of these things and of course this house that was connected to the whole uh what is it the mcmartin preschool thing that ted gunnerson was talking about it it was destroyed supposedly by a bunch of upset people from the local church right but it turned out that the upset people from the local church were actually trying to hide the evidence because there was a tunnel that actually went to the church. So I have a lot of photos of this fun stuff. It's really difficult to actually go there, but if you if you find it, you know, it's it's kind of 
interesting to look at because it's still there. But their thing is, is that there's a house next door. The people of Crestline are not exactly innocent, okay? There's a lot of Satanists there. There are cities in the USA, a lot of them, that are basically hives for these Satanists. Uh, you know, by the way, uh, you, you might not have uh, known this, or maybe you might have heard this, but um, going back to uh, Stephen Greer and uh, his group, the C-SETI 5 or whatever it's called, um, that group with the, you know, they go out in the desert and uh, at nighttime and shine lasers in the sky. And, you know, he makes a lot of money doing this. And oddly enough, a lot of uh, Satanists actually go out there to this uh, sort of thing. A lot of them that, that are involved in this group are actually Satanists, by the way. Yeah, I wonder why. Well, this is what, yeah, I'm like, I'm curious what your <laughs> thoughts and opinions were on, on that, by the way, Well, Stephen. it goes back to the whole S-T-O-S-T-S. The things they're trying to contact are S-T-S. Those are the demons, okay? Yeah. The good guys, the S-T-O, they don't talk to us. They don't interfere with us. They don't threaten us. They don't make deals. They don't hand over technology. That's the bad guys that do that. They don't suck our blood and do all the terrible things that they do. So yeah, of course the Satanists are trying to make contact with this, with these people, those entities, because those are the so-called demons. I mean, there's a big difference between, uh, you know, a, a d demon like a that we think of in you know from a religious standpoint and one of these dark entities. Seriously, what they do is is hell on earth. They are they are they are the demons. You know these these silly uh, reptiles. You know they torture all this torture and and horrible things that they do to children and and adults and what have you. It's intended to be horrible for a reason because they need this this negative human emotional psychic energy. You know that that they use as a food product on a higher level of density that is required because they are 50% spiritual entity unlike us. We don't have a very large spirit there. That's the whole way the system works. The higher levels feed on the lower levels. It's like us eating plants and animals. It's the same thing. We're food to them. Okay, but it's not just blood. They also require an energetic nutrient, which is our chi. You know, this energy that we have in us, you know, our life force. Right. You know, I mean, they stole, they steal souls. They do all kinds of crazy things. Uh, that's what cloning is. Cloning is, is soul stealing, basically. Right. And there's companies that you can pay to uh, clone your pets, by the way. Well, yeah, but that's a biological thing. It's not really the same. You know, right. It's, Correct. It's like uh, uh, your soul is your blueprint. And when you go to a higher level, you're high, uh, say like the 4D, which is above, not four-dimensional, but fourth density. Right. Uh, thought is creation, causes creation. And that's essentially, that's what the soft matter is. That's what the dark matter is. It's, it's, it's basically fluid matter that is waiting to be given instruction. And it, it's that brain power, these scalar uh, instructions that we produce that that cause that to happen. You know, on, on this level we call that manifestation, but on the higher level it's basically instantaneous. So your soul, of course, is basically a bunch of data that of that is basically what you are, and it once you have extracted that or copied that information because it's just a big sine wave then you could recreate it somewhere else. And that's exactly what a quantum computer is. Right. So, and these are all things you know. that have been talked about, by the way, like by, or for a good example, like John Lear. You know, he's been on here on the program talking about the, the importance of the soul and what these entities want with it. And, you know, you hear things about the Pentagon. You hear how some of them are saying these things are like demonic and there's like a spiritual aspect in all this. And, you know, we've been hearing this for years. So it is a rather interesting time right now that we're in, Stephen, that not many people are even aware of. 
Uh, but I've been following uh, all, all this stuff going on, and I'm sure you have too. So I'm sure you're vastly interested in what's going on with the government and actually disclosing that there's a force out there much greater than us. Well, you know, if you wanted to look at this from a religious perspective, um, you know, because a lot of some a good portion of the people out there do that. Yeah, I'll I'll say this. Um, Jesus says that he's going to use our foot to step on to crush the serpent. That basically tells me that we're not waiting for savior aliens. We're not waiting for angels. We're not waiting for Jesus himself to come here and do the heavy lifting. That's what we're here for. So we're here to save ourselves, and we're here to bring essentially paradise back on earth. And I've got the. Uh, inside exclusive that this piece of real estate right here is the key to doing that mm. and they told me that they i told mean you I, that. I was they told me that yeah the well after they had figured out who i was eventually i had gone uh, i went out to dinner uh well that was the night where they figured out who i was actually but i went out to dinner with this guy this uh trust fund manager templar dude mm. And once he figured out who I was, he basically said that they have technology, basically. And this was Project Looking Glass. That's what he called it. And he said that this Project Looking Glass only went up to 2012. And of course, like I said, this was uh, 1990 that this happened. Or I don't know. I have to go back and look how many years ago it happened. But, but he basically said that uh, they've been waiting for me. They, they've been, you know, for like, thousands of years, whatever, and that uh, they knew that I was going to destroy them. And they also knew that they couldn't stop me. They couldn't kill me. There was nothing they could do to avoid what was coming. But their technology only allowed them to see so much, so they didn't know how it was going to happen. But what they did think, you know, what their assumption was, was that it was going to be a, a violent military type situation, kind of like what they tried to portray in Matrix mm. you know, with all the guns and you know right. that kind of thing. And that was me actually, because one of the things that I did back in those days was I I did body armor, and one of the things that I sold, which really scared the crap out of those Getty guys, was a armored raincoat. You know, you call it trench coat, whatever. But we would armor those things with Kevlar down to the knees, okay? So that was one of the options. You could have it down to your groin, but you could also have it all the way down to your knees. And they were scared that I was gonna show up with a bunch of people wearing trench coats and a bunch of weapons, and we were gonna do one of these things. But but just gotta be, to be honest with you, since early, early on, I had been collecting these psychics because I knew that it was gonna be a psychic thing. and. And uh, I realized right away, you know, after getting kind of closer to these Getty people, that there wasn't any kind of weapon or anything that I could create that could, you know, not just defeat aliens, but force my way into their thing. I mean, trust me, I was working on secret weapons. I had this one thing called a plasma beam that uh, was a big flashlight that I was trying to turn into something that I could dissolve uh, steel with you know like a you know disintegrate you it, it works it works oh, in other words yeah i get all see they don't, they don't like me they got me all all pixelated all pixelated yeah that's weird you're um, must have been something i said it triggered something in there <laughs> yeah it triggered something but anyway yeah that was the plasma beam they wanted to turn it into a a weapon that would make people like 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 the thing on uh was that men in black you oh know, yeah men in black. So, yeah okay that was what they really wanted they wanted to turn it into a thing that give you like an epileptic seizure oh shit and that didn't work but then i figured out i could turn it into one of these ray guns <laughs> that's like and some it, sci-fi stuff here i like that well it's 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 really simple is that uh, it was using a plasma an actual plasma and a plasma is modulated and you can modulate this thing at super high frequency and it'll give off waves like sound waves you know and uh, you can't hear it, of course. Yeah. And if you have a high enough frequency, it'll break a crystal, you know, just like an opera singer kind of a thing. And uh, so 
steel is a crystal, you know, metal, metal is crystal. You just have to have a high enough frequency and you could, you could break it. So this was something I was, this is a concept I came up with. <laughs> as soon as I came up with this concept, the Israelis wanted one immediately. I got a call the next day from Israeli military, IDF, I think it was, one of, Israeli military industries, IMI, or one of those places. <laughs> I, they go, yeah, we want to buy one of your, one of your plasma beams. I said, who told you? <laughs> How do you know? How do you know about that? Yeah, this? they know. Yeah, well. <laughs> and, then, and then promptly after that, the government declared it a destructive device, basically. Mm. So I know they're, this is how you know they're watching everything I do. Um, crazy stuff. They know about stuff I was going to invent before I invented it. But, How'd they know that? Well, because they had their crystal ball, man. They, they knew, well, okay, well, like I told you, they were watching my brother. My brother was also a big laser dude. He did, he did really big lasers. I did small lasers. He did big lasers. But, but I created this one thing that I should have made the billion dollars off of, but I backed out, and that was the three-beam laser. And this was going to go on all the, all the guns. You know, everybody in the Army was going to get one of these things. Instead of the, the laser you see on the guns now, those are made by a CIA company. But I was going to get the contract, and it was going to be like 700,000 of these uh, lasers, which, which would have been about $500 billion. And you know I would have, got, I would have made a lot more. Or five hundred million, yeah, five hundred million, half a billion. But I didn't do it because, you know, that's a lot of blood, right? Right. So, hmm. yeah, a lot to think yeah. about then. Uh, but anyway, someone else did it, right? <laughs> yeah. If you were going to do it, someone else was. Well, nobody would do it the same way. That's the thing. I mean, my stuff was so good, nobody would do it the same way. It's just it's part of the corruption, you know. I mean. And they're going to make it too expensive. My product was relatively cheap. It was better and it was cheaper. You know, I mean, I, I made stuff that, and the other thing was I was kind of a pirate. I didn't tell anybody what I was going to do. I would uh. just make something and take pictures of it, put it out on the internet. And there wasn't anything. And then, you know, the whole world could see it at that point. <laughs> That's pretty funny. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, but the three beam laser thing, um, they were always asking my brother, hey, when are you going to make that, that multi-beam laser? And he's like, what? What are you talking about? And then I was the one that actually made it, and I didn't know anything about what they were interested in. But I remember when I was designing the silly, silly thing on my drafting table, I knew that I was being, somebody was behind me watching me. You know, I could feel it. I'm like, what? I'm turning around like, what? Uh -huh. you know, why do I feel like there's somebody watching over, looking over my shoulder? So... They have the like men in black types that uh, I, they're phase shifters. You know, that's one of the other things we learned from the Getty guys is that these phase shifters, they go back and forth in time. They go to different dimensions. They do all this stuff. It's, it's another thing of the whole quantum. When the quantum computers are made, they'll be able to do. You got to have a quantum computer to do that stuff. But uh, but yeah, anyway, the whole can't be killed club. That's the thing. Um, they flat out told me they couldn't kill me, even if they wanted to. But they wanted to be friendly. They wanted to try to make deals with me and see if I would work with them. You know, that's all they could do is try to, you know, you hold your enemies, your friends closer, your enemies closer. I that's see. what they wanted to do. And they wanted me to basically go in their little bunker and uh, be kind of a, like an Antichrist type character or something like that, you know, sit on their little throne and all that shit. But they wanted me to basically. agree to everybody getting killed you know everybody else you know all the everybody which is what they're trying to do right now you know so yeah this so so i know that the best way to stop them from trying to kill everybody is to expose them and and again they they know i'm going to take them out they didn't know how i was going to do it they thought i was going to use guns and secret weapons and stuff oh, and i saw I, I thought i was going to do it too but then i went and that when I got close to them, though, here's what really happened. Yeah, what they, happened? They want they wanted to uh, recruit me, okay? Mm. And and uh, when the trust fund manager dude 
he kind of when we first did the whole business where we went with a psychic and and the remote viewer and we scouted their thing out for sure i thought they were going to kill us and they got really upset and that's how we knew that it was real because they got really upset and but the guy that was the trust fund manager who we were friendly with he basically said, no, these are my people. If you want me to do this, then you're going to have to deal with my people. So right away, they tried to say, okay, and they wanted to, they, again, they didn't know who I was at the time, but they wanted to give my brother uh, like a military rank and try to incorporate him into their little system. And he was really, you know, uh, egotistical. So he kind of went with the thing. It's sort of like joining the Masons. And then, and then eventually, when they found out about me, and they they you know I had my company SK Industries at the time, and on my web page for my company I had all these crazy weapons and lasers and helmets and gas masks and shields and you know crazy stuff you know plasma beam, and uh, so they were they were really kind of paranoid, and but they they said. Well, we're not Democrats, we're not Republicans, we're not Nazis, we're not uh, uh, Jews. You know, we're just we're just humans, and you need to help us protect the Earth. You know, and this is after I had found out, you know, from that guy Vince that I thought it was all about protocols of Zion stuff, but no, it's actually Nazis. So there's Nazis and Zionists working side by side because they're the same thing. But anyway, so. So I told him, I said, okay, I'll work with you under one condition as you don't shoot any more airplanes down because they were going to, you know, they had just shot down flight 800. And I said, okay. So the first thing they wanted me to do was help them create some kind of weapon that they could use against aliens, you know, because the earth was going to be invaded and we need to save the earth and protect the humans and all this stuff. I thought, all right, I'll, I'll put my head on that. So I'm thinking of all kinds of different things that I realized that whatever we could come up with, they already had a way around it, you know? So I thought, all right, maybe we, we got to incorporate some religious thing or get spiritual or whatever. And that's when I realized that the only way you're going to be able to do any of this stuff is with psychic skill, because that's our only real thing we got going. So I got, I kind of stopped. That's when I stopped with all the gun stuff and the laser stuff and the technology. And I started pouring myself into the whole development, psychic development, learning every little silly thing you could imagine, tarot, you know, whatever, you know, everything. I, become, I became a Reiki master. I'm like a Reiki master level six. I was a healer before I even did that, but I did everything. I, I studied Buddhism. I studied uh, all the ancient history, you know, the Canaanite stuff, the Babylonian stuff, the Hebrew stuff, the you name it, the Chinese stuff. And anyway, and then I went through a couple of other wake-ups, but the point is, is uh, now I'm really good at that stuff because apparently I always did have a lot of skill, and I found I learned about Rambo. I, I do all this psychic stuff now. I do healing. I do really, I do miracles right now. It's crazy. I do miracles. I healed a blind woman, you know, and the doctors go, oh, you were never blind. You know, they took all her money when she was blind, but now that she's not blind, they say, oh, you were never blind. You know? Wow. Yeah, it's crazy. That's pretty terrible. Uh, it sucks, you know, because me being naive, I'm like, oh, wow, we healed you? Great. Let's get some other people that need healing. <laughs> Wrong. Right. I mean, I'll tell you, I'll do a healing on somebody. Somebody who's died. I mean, have, very often I'll save somebody that's going to die and no one will say anything. But sometimes something will happen where I have to save somebody who had been actually touched by doctors and stuff. And then they're, they're all trying to figure out why they got these results when it's, it's clearly not the case. You know, like a woman that had sepsis, she had really bad, which is fatal. Right. Sepsis is fatal. And they took her, they, they threw her in an ambulance and took her to the hospital and did a blood test. But by the time they took that blood test, I had healed her. And, and so the blood test, uh, the blood test came back positive, but they sent her home that night because her conditions improved so much that they could send her home, which is not something they would do for somebody with sepsis. And anyway, when that blood test finally came back the next day, they, she tested totally positive and they went and, just 
total emergency. They went and got her, but then they gave her another test, and she was, it was there was nothing there, no trace of it. So so right away, you know, when something like that happens, they got to call in all the specialists, try to figure out what happened, how does it go from this to that. I've had people that were in a co induced coma on an operating table that were dying from pneumonia. They had like a O2 or whatever of uh, 7% which is like, you're going to die. And I'd bring them up to 100% from a thousand miles away, you know, almost immediately. And I've done that at least three times with people. One of them was a little baby that was in Britain. One of them was a 16-year-old girl who was in a coma. And one of them was a... 80 something year old woman who was taken on, you know, oxygen. She had been oxygen for two years. And after I treated her, she didn't need oxygen anymore. You know, so I've, I've done that. And during COVID, I mean, I cleaned up a lot of COVID. You know, I do animals. Animals are sad because, you know, it's like when they're old, and they're ready to go and they got, you know, cancer or something. You don't want it. They need to, they have short, they have animals have really fast reincarnation cycles, so you, hmm. it's, it's better to let them go. <laughs> Interesting. I, I didn't know that. Well, yeah. It's like, for instance, if you see a dead animal or something, yeah. go pick it up and take care of it and bury it and, because everybody sees that. Right. You know, the animal kingdom sees that. And this whole service to others thing doesn't just apply to humans, you know, <laughs> right? So, right. Yeah, you want to gain the brownie points, and that's how you take care, you know, start with the animals. Plants, too, for that matter. Right. No, I agree with you. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, one of the things I wanted to mention here, I'm sure plenty of first-time listen listeners out there are, are thinking that we have both lost our uh, collective minds, and there's nothing more frightening than reality, unfortunately. And, you know, we're talking about all kinds of things. You know, we talked about uh human trafficking we talked about the getty and uh, you know all these things all these yeah, things are starting to come to fruition though I, I mean when i say that is one by one those involved in these activities are being plucked out and the biggest players in that game have yet to be revealed and i briefly mentioned this before and there has been evidence proving that there are even major corporations also involved in the trafficking of humans in America and out of America. Again, it's not entirely a secret. This has been going on for a long, long time. And it was even reported just last year that late last year, that 85,000 children, probably even more, went missing uh, after crossing the border. And of course, the Border Patrol has no clue where those children actually went. And I would say that's uh, probably something to be a little bit concerned about. Uh, I'm sure most people are once they hear things like that. Well, again, uh, that, of course, has been going on for a long time. Um, J. Paul Getty, when he built his first bunker on, in, over there in Malibu, he had them coming in on containers, you know, from the Philippines. And, of course, these containers are marked art, so, so Customs does not open the container. And that's been a law in the books for a long time for many administrations. And I don't care who your choice for president is. Neither one of those guys got rid of that law. So you got to wonder who's working for who. Right. But I'll, when you talk about this elitism thing, um, this is a good example because it's like when I was telling you about how they were going to basically offer me the world as long as I would agree to people dying. I realized right after that that all these people on the surface, all these egos, all these people with their money and their various levels of like your Bill Gates types and your whatever, how this guy with that money or that guy with that money, they're they're really small when it comes to the people underground. Those guys underground, that's a whole nother level of elitism and these people on the surface you know, it doesn't matter even, I mean, the royalty is as high as you could get here on earth, but everyone else that kisses up to the royalty, you know, they make a few billion dollars, you know, and they, they want to be special. They're, they're like, 
they're treated like dirt by the people underground. And then the people underground, there's levels of elitism that are above them, like on the moon. And then on the moon, there's people that are above them, and they're on Mars. So, so the point is, is that this elitism thing, I mean, how far do you want to go? You know, that's that ego, that's, that's again, it's the service to self mentality. And, and when you really get down to it, if you wanted to wrap this up, you could, this is the real message here. And that is that uh, you're going to have to choose between service to self and service to others. And eventually, probably sooner than you think, you're not going to be able to choose anymore, you know, because you don't get to sit on the fence on this one. You, you really have to go. You want to continue being a human. You want to see heaven and all that. You better find ways to serve others without expectation of compensation. Otherwise, you're going to find yourself in the 4D with uh, constant torture and constant pain. And that's, that's really what's waiting for you. It's, I'll, I'll tell you something else. Let me just throw that at you is that the reality of uh, hell, it's not eternal because there's no time over there, okay? So what you think is eternity is actually about, you know, a handful of years in, in the grand scheme of things. But it's going to seem like eternity to you. So anyway. Very interesting. You, okay. I know we, we've been going on a long time here, uh, Stephen, but I have just a two more other things i wanted to quickly mention here as i as, as i talked about your youtube channel that you say is no longer in working order but i was also listening to that channel and you mentioned uh, waco and i've always found that uh, interesting i mean i always suspected that david koresh was an asset for the cia sort of like how bin laden was our guy in the middle east uh, now uh, david what was david involved with the the clintons as you i believe you said that right um he was involved with the whole cocaine smuggling business with in mena arkansas in mena arkansas right yeah um i don't remember what the exact connection was because i'm not really you know that's a whole nother lifetime ago but, right uh yeah. it's just i had never heard of that connection but that is pretty interesting well, it was a big deal, but again, right. this is all, this is that mafia, you know, the Intertel mafia, uh, not too long ago, you know, they were, there was a time when, when Bill Clinton was actually, the, they were going to consider killing him because he had, he had stolen a whole bunch of, uh, money from, from their cocaine operation. Uh, Barry Seals was involved right. and, uh, so was Manuel Noriega and, and Bill Barr was one of the high-ranking mafia dudes that was involved in this. Uh, let's see, George Bush Sr. was there. Uh, I think Oliver North was there. But they decided that they were going to uh, imprison Noriega, kill Barry Seal, and, and they would make Clinton governor. <laughs> so That's yeah. hilarious. So it, this, it's, it's crazy because... You know, I, I see these people out there with their yeah. Trump stuff and their Hillary stuff and their Biden stuff, and they just have no I, no clue that it's just one big ass mafia. You know, it's it's not. It's uh, here's a question I like to throw out to people, but uh, the Intertel Mafia, of course, was run by Robert Vesco. He he was the boss. The only thing that was higher than him was uh, Rothschild family. And the Queen, okay, he was he was no, probably number three on the totem pole, but when he died, who took over? Who the hell took over for Robert Vesco? Now, to me, the best way to try to figure that out would be to figure out who took over Resorts International, which was which was the uh, front company for the CIA for this whole operation, and it was. Uh, it was taken over by Donald Trump. Interesting. So, you know. Yeah, it really doesn't. Knows it, right. All, all, all politicians are bad. It doesn't matter which suit you cheer for. Eh, it's the uh, same mafia. Yeah, it's all the same thing. And just look at John Wayne Gacy, by the way. He had plenty of high-level politicians on his side. And some say he was even a hitman for, or hitman for them. And I can't ascertain that, but 
Again, probably not well, too far off. Well, he probably off. collected children for them. Right. You never know. Victims. Yeah, yeah. Th that would make uh, sense. That's a big... I mean, look at people like uh, Jimmy Seville. Yeah. You know, he, he did it. Right. Uh, this is... people. P. Diddy. Why was P. P. Diddy, Diddy so... Right. He, what, he collected children. He collected minors. He trafficked children to these people. But, yeah. you know, here's the thing about P. Diddy. It's like Candace Owens said, so... so, so uh, Astute, astutely is that when the FBI goes in there and raids the place, they're not looking for evidence. They're there to destroy evidence. It's the same thing they did on Epstein Island. That's true. You know, and the same thing would happen if they tried to go under the Getty. They would say, oh, there's nothing there. We took care of it. But it's just like all these people that believe there are white hats out there mm. saving children. There's no white yeah, hats. Yeah, that, that's not real. There's, there's no U.S. military rescuing children. There's no tunnels being blown up <laughs> uh, it's hard to believe that part but yeah I, I agree with you but going back to the finders really quickly they were also facilitating breeding grounds and these people are always deeply interested in eugenics and wouldn't you know it jeffrey epstein was also deeply involved and interested in all that sort of thing very very true and again the finders uh, here, were an international group by the way and of course i i think they probably even still they probably still around they're probably still around to this day but you know these things don't just go away they evolve well, here's the thing. Oh, damn it. What they happened? They tried to, uh, I don't know if you heard that or uh, not. No, you're good. Okay, cool. The, they try to keep everything within certain bloodlines. For instance, like the guy that was the trust fund manager of the Getty, he was 100% Greek. Okay, so this is like Noah's Ark. They want to have mm. pure yeah. blood, 100% German, 100% Irish, 100% whatever. Okay, that... You know, that's that's how they do it. So it's just like if you were collecting up animals, specimens, you'd want this, the purest you could get. That's that's what these people are. So they're very concerned about it. But here's the other thing is that this is one of the reasons why they're ready to basically kill us all off is because they don't need us anymore because they are breeding down there. It's just like the slavery during the Civil War. They got to a point to where they didn't need to import people into the country because there were so many of them in here that they could start breeding them here and they could fill all their needs with domestic breeding. And it's the same thing they're doing underground. They've got to the point now where there's so many of these victims down there that they they can just breed as many new people as they want. That's why when you look at that film made by Isaac Cappy that shows these little girls mm. in that uh, spa, they look like everything's normal because they were born there. They don't know any different. You know, they weren't, they're not abductees. But yeah, abductees, those are, they're eaten. And I'll tell you something else. All the concrete in the world has blood in it, okay? That's how concrete is made. It requires, it, it requires blood. If they're not using, they're typically using blood from slaughterhouses and stuff like that, but there's a significant amount out of, of blood in all concrete. This is the reason why the concrete industry is controlled by this international mafia, like CMEX, you know, largest concrete company in the world. Mm. So, so yeah, where are they getting that blood underground? They certainly don't have cows down there. Right. Like that, you know, so, yeah. So these victims, nothing is wasted. Seriously, nothing is wasted. It, it, it's, it's, it's very, very sick. And, That's pretty and wild. A, 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 an elite pedophile will consume 5,000 children in their lifetime. And we're talking about underground cities full of these elite pedophiles. So, yeah, they need a lot of children. That's pretty wild stuff there. I mean, I, I wish I could um, continue on with this. But one last thing, Stephen, one last thing before I let you go. And by the way, I don't mean to fan any flames here. However, one night I was randomly watching some sort of clip. And it was a clip of you arguing with uh, Carrie Cassidy. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious, what the hell was that all about, by the way? Okay, uh, Carrie's going to deny this, and she denied that in the clip. I'm sure this is the one you're talking about, but I wasn't really arguing because that was a setup. I was that was a hit piece on me, but ambush. Uh, Carrie, I was working on some high technology stuff. We had discovered how to program a solid state laser with a uh, scalar code, which was basically we could do magic, you know, and we could transmit, and the enemy couldn't stop it, and because of this. The Bilderbergers put a hit out on me and two other guys, the guys I was working with. And we were all 
connected to Carrie. Uh, this was this were these were people that were basically on her team, her Camelot I see. Okay. team, and and we were kind of like a little gang. We were like Knights of Camelot, you know, blah blah blah. But mm. anyway, mm. so we did this technology, and and as soon as I did this discovery with a solid state laser, they kind of shit their pants because it was it was a really significant discovery, and they put a hit out on us. And so Carrie calls me up from London, and she she was at uh, some event, you know, she was. The cover story was that she was at an event to talk about uh, a solar eclipse or something, an equinox that was happening, and, and the events were going on at, what was it, Stonehenge or some stupid thing like this. But the reality was that the Bilderbergers were meeting, and now she'll say that she was there with David Icke and Alex Jones, and they mm. were covering the event. Well, David Icke and Alex Jones are fucking Bilderbergers. Come on. Carrie is too. So, so she calls me up, and she says, hey— it's me, Carrie Cassidy. Uh, I'm I'm here in London at the Bilder Bilderbergers meeting, and they they put a hit out on you, Thunder and Jerry. I'm like, what? And I'm like, wow, Carrie, I really appreciate you telling me this, but what are you doing at the Bilderberger meeting? You know? And she's like, yeah, well, you know, I'm. And then she gave me this crazy story about how. By being an insider, she could control, she could have influence on, you know, it's kind of, this is old this trope, you know, Satanists say, I'll do that. Well, I'm going to try to introduce some light into the darkness, you know. Anyway, this is kind of the thing I they see. usually okay. say. But, but so, so I told her, I said, well, Carrie, I really appreciate you telling me this. I'm sorry that you had to divulge that you were a Bilderberger and all that, but I'm going to deal with this now. And I basically went into the whole Rambo mode and got a whole bunch of guardians behind me. And I didn't need it anyway because I was in that can't be killed club thing. But we went and called up this guy in uh, Australia who's an NSA guy and he works over there at Alice Springs. And uh, Alice okay. Springs is like the listening post for what they call that, the uh, Pine Gap. Mm. Anyway, so Pine Gap monitors all the communications in the world. And he was able to basically verify that, yes, indeed, the Bilderbergers had put a hit out on me and the other guys, and it was kind of going out over the wire, so to speak. So that's when we found out about it. But anyway, I just, you know, I don't really talk about that story a lot, but but the point is, it's like you're asking me about all these so-called whistleblowers. There's, there's, <laughs> there's no whistleblowers. Seriously, most of them are not whistleblowers. Most of them are like, well, uh, researchers or something. But very, very rarely are you going to find somebody that actually went through some real crap talking about it. Maybe somebody like, uh, oh, I can't, that woman that, that talked about all the, you know, I can't remember. But like, like these victims that go down and go through this torture and stuff, they don't. They don't reveal themselves. They're pro they're programmed in such a way that it's extremely difficult to to you know be a whistleblower. But like Allie Carter, people talk about Allie Carter. She was a, a girl who was like supposedly went under the Getty. I believe she did go under the Getty, and I believe she also killed children under the Getty and was part of satanic rituals. And that's why she was allowed to come to the surface. And they are basically using her to discredit my information and try to take over my mission with this black girl <laughs> i heard that yeah i saw that i i didn't know if you knew who this woman was so i'm glad you mentioned that yeah well that's what ali carter is ali carter is one of them she's she's a witch i mean i oh. when i first learned about ali carter she was on Stu peters and that's one of your big clues that Stu peters is the enemy also hello charlie ward take your pick you know come on these guys are all in it for the bucks they're all psyop hell uh What's her face? Carrie Cassidy. Again, I don't, you know, I, don't get me wrong. I love Carrie Cassidy, okay? She's, I, I don't hate her at all. But at the same time, she was the bag lady for the Bilderbergers. She would basically distribute money downward to all these uh, co COINTEL people. And one of the biggest ones, of course, was Revolution Radio, which had, which I had brought oh, up to yeah. like a million listeners. I remember you know? Revolution Radio, yeah. Yeah, well, I brought that. I made that station. I went, took it from thirty thousand listeners up to one million listeners. Really? That was all you. That was all me. Nice. And a lot of people don't want to hear it, but 
Carrie Cassidy was the big draw on that channel. She, but her biggest show was 80,000 listeners. Mm -hmm. My biggest show was well over a million in one night. And, and my, uh, for me, a bad night was 250,000 listeners. <laughs> that was just an average night. But yeah, I, I made them. And I did it again. I did it with, uh, I went to another station, uh, American Freedom Radio. Oh, yeah. And I took them up to a million listeners in like three months. Wow. You know. And then I started my own station, Truth Cat Radio, www.truthcatradio.com. I figured Truth Cat who can't remember that or spell it right? Right, right. and of course, and radio. of course, that banner that he used—I mean, that's a brilliant, uh, brilliant choice of uh, implementing the, the cat right in the middle there. Yeah, well, yeah. Who, you're talking about my banner, or You're yeah, the, the banner on the truthcatradio.com. Oh, well, again, I, cat, I think, is one of the first words we learn how to spell, right? Right. So I figured people could re people could remember a cat, but. But anyway, Anywho. the point is, I was trying to make this real quick, that I can't get the listeners I can. I mean, I'm blockaded. I can't get anybody to tune into Truth Cat Radio. It's hard to get every traction. Every Thursday night. Yeah, every Thursday what? night, go check them out. Well, it's not the traction thing. It's it's the, they don't let you on. I mean, all right, here's the thing I was trying to say with Carrie Cassidy. I've got to say this quick, but go ahead. They they have these tricks that they use. That actually, I had a, a guy that was a uh, forensic investigator for Internet Forensic Investigator, and he traced every single domain and every single subdomain that was being used by everybody from Hillary Clinton on down to uh, Kerry Cassidy and what have you. And it turns out what they do to get these big numbers of listeners is they have, they use pornography. They'll have these porn channels, and sometimes the porn channels don't even exist but they're domain names, you know, like really disgusting domain names. And a lot, the guys that create these things, some of the times they'll, they'll uh, customize it to the person, like Carrie Cassidy's. Her stuff was all really uh, nasty. But anyway. Oh, you're saying they use redirects and uh, send traffic they, that yeah. way. Okay. It, so, so, yeah, it, that's where all this traffic comes from. And it bas the, the reason, the thing, basically what it means is that unless you do this, you can't get through all the internet hurdles and blockades and and uh, you mm. know what they call those things uh, shadow bands. Right. Yeah. Oh, I know she all. Was the, definitely part of that. I know all about the you algorithm. About yeah, I know about the algorithm, and I know how I am the enemy of all algorithms out there. I mean, this show is like it's a little too real. You got some tricks, huh? Oh yeah, but I mean, uh, times we're out there, but uh, there's a lot of suppression on this uh, on the show that you're on. There's a real well, deal here. Well, you know what? That just tells me that, that your listeners are going to be in for a treat then. Oh, they're going to love this. And, I, you know, I thank you so much for being a part of the program, Stephen. I wish I could have reached out to you sooner, but I don't know what the hell happened. But I'm glad you uh, were here, and I'm glad we kicked some ass together. And this was a great time. And, uh, Stephen, thank you so much, my friend. Plug anything you like before uh, we cut you loose. All right. Well, first of all, if you want a copy of my book, you can you can email me. I'll send it. I'll send you a PDF for free. And the email is law seventeen gun at aol dot com. That's l a w one seven g u n at aol dot com. Uh, I have a group on Telegram, which is the most secure place to communicate with me. Uh, it's called Occupy the Getty slash Stephen D Kelly. And of course, if you're on Twitter, please join me on Twitter since that's such an important medium right now and it's at uh, Stephen Kelly 24 just do a search you'll find me there's all sorts of stations out there on Twitter occupy the Getty children under the Getty uh, open the Getty you know there's just crazy all kinds we're a lot we're getting really big but I just uh, the main thing I want to leave you with is that a I really want you to to contact me and, and b if you need healing of any sort whatsoever don't be afraid send me an email I'll tell you what to do but the last thing I want to leave you with is this is it. This is There is no plan. This is the plan. This is the only thing that's going to work. This is how we get our world back. we got to go through this little building right here, and that is the weak link in the chain. It's the, it's the, it's the main card in the house of cards. You know, this is the first domino we got to push. This is, this is the, where Dracula is. This is where we need to stick the stake. So if you want to end it all, you don't go after all the BS minions and crap you go right where the throne is and this this will kill the vampire and this will free our world and this is the only way we're going to do it 
And I'm, I just hope more people realize that as soon as possible while I'm still alive. Very nice. Once again, thank you so much. And I'll see you on the other side, my friend. All right. Good luck.